A very good morning and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Welcome to today's Hindu news analysis with us where we shall be analyzing the important articles which are UPSC relevant taken from the Hindu New Delhi publication for 18th April 2024. So here we have a set of six articles, three of which need a detailed analysis for being relevant to your UPSC mains exam. So these three range from how Climate mitigation is not enough. What we really need is an all-inclusive and sustainable climate mitigation. Now, how? That is exactly what the first article here talks about. The second article that is relevant from Mainz talks about the ongoing problem of heat wave in India. And to mitigate this, the governments at various levels, that is the state government, the local bodies at the districts have been adopting the heat action plans. Let us have a look at what are these and what are certain challenges associated with these. The last article for Mainz talks about how agroforestry can save life of many, many farmers, life, livelihood, because it is not only environmentally friendly, but also a huge step that can be taken to promote agriculture productivity. From here, we shall look at three brief factual articles from the prelims perspective. The first one here talks about the green credit program and the second one talks about how Israel has reiterated its strict stand that it shall take any step for its defense as it may deem necessary. And this is despite the mounting global pressure on Israel to not retaliate to Iran's attack. The last article for the day is from Economy, which talks about what is the projected growth of India's GDP in the coming economic or financial year. So with this, we shall begin our analysis of the very first article, which has been taken from page 8, relevant for GS Paper 3 Ecology. And you might also notice that how in today's newspaper, multitude of articles have been talking about environment. Now, there are just two things which are the prime highlights as of now. One is the upcoming Lok Sabha election and the second is the ongoing heat wave in peninsular India. So on that light, the very first article talks about how we need to promote inclusive environmental change in reference with one of a very, very endangered species of animal known as the Great Indian Bustard, a very well-known species of bird and the article mentions how. The government has time and again failed to create a sustainable renewable energy program which would also ensure protection and safety of the Great Indian Bustard which is primarily located in the northwestern parts of India. So what does the article say? Let's quickly have a look. And before we jump into the key aspects of article, a quick reminder about the Great Indian Bustard. Now this scientifically is known as Ardiotis negriceps. That's the scientific name for the great Indian bustard. Now, it is one of the very, very heavy flying birds. In fact, it is known for its horizontal body. It is known for having a very poor frontal view. It is because of this that the great Indian bustard is prone to many accidents. So, not only is it hunted and poached, but also it is susceptible to collisions, accidents because of various electric equipments because it has a poor frontal view in front of it and therefore special care needs to be taken in areas which are inhabited by this species of bird. Now this animal is listed in Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972 as well as it has been enlisted in the CITES Convention which creates a list of critically endangered animals and apart from that it is also in the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List. So therefore it enjoys a very high protection status in India and in other regions of the world as well. Now talking about how many or exactly what is the population estimate of the remaining great Indian bustard in India right now. So it is pretty threatening to note that the population of this animal has declined by 75% in the last three decades only. So therefore, initially it was known to be distributed not only across northwestern India, but also in certain states like Karnataka, Andhra and Maharashtra. But today, if you talk about as of 23, 2024, then primarily the population is situated in the Thar Desert region. That is in region of Gujarat and Rajasthan. 
latest, it has been noted that barely out of 150 existing birds, 128, that's a major portion, comes from the state of Rajasthan itself. And let's look at this interesting paradox. Now, on the one hand, we are saying that Rajasthan is known for being endemic to the great Indian bustard. It is also the state bird of Rajasthan. And at the same time, Rajasthan also is known for the Bhadla Solar Power Project. So what are we highlighting? We are trying to point out the paradox that on the one hand, Rajasthan and the Desert National Park is known for endangered species which are very, very vulnerable today. And they are also very special because they are only found in the desert ecosystem. And at the same time, due to extremely high temperatures, this is also the region which has massive solar power potential. So we are talking about a time when the government is readily adopting solar energy. And it is this transition, the need for the transition from non-renewable sources like fossil fuels and carbon from here to taking up renewable sources of energy, particularly solar energy, is something that is coming into a scanner now. Because today, as we make a transition from non-renewable to renewable sources of energy, we do not realize that there are flora and fauna, there are endemic species of animals and birds and plants which are getting neglected. In fact, they are getting harmed in a major way because of the quickly because of the rapidly being created solar power project. Now, there are transmission lines that are going overhead, as this picture is demonstrating. There are solar panels. Now, most of the times, birds like the Great Indian Buster, they end up accidentally colliding these strong power lines. Sometimes they get electrocuted. Sometimes it strangulates them. So overall, despite the fact that the government is saying that this is not the only reason behind falling population of the bird. There are many other important reasons, but the Supreme Court says that this is also one reason that cannot be neglected. And let's remember the debate is nothing new. This has been going on right since 2020. Now, there are PILs, there are environmental experts who have pointed out that the government needs utmost caution in areas where the Great Indian Bustard is very, very common. So, Specifically, with regards to upcoming solar power plants, we need to be very sure that the equipment does not harm these birds. So the entire article is based on this argument. The main concern today is creating a balance between shifting towards solar power on the one hand to go carbon neutral. And on the other hand, how do we take care of our vulnerable species at the same time? So as I said, the great Indian bustard is a very heavy bird. It is about a meter in height and its frontal vision is low, which means that due to a poor frontal vision, it is not able to avoid the high voltage and the low voltage lines that are created in solar power projects. And it is because of that the birds often get electrocuted and it has been witnessed that a huge number of such episodes have happened in the past. So it was in this light that during April 2021, the Supreme Court had said that all the wires which are going overhead, they should be created underground. There should not be any wire above the ground, specifically in areas which are known as priority and potential habitats of the Great Indian Buster. So what do we mean by priority and potential habitats. So while priority zones are the ones where great Indian bustard is found in heavy number, potential regions are where conservation programs are already taking place. Now we might remember that Rajasthan has been one of very few states which has taken a committed program to protect the great Indian bustard. Hence, in all these areas which are now the breeding regions, conservation regions for the bird, the government, rather the court said that let's be sure that we have to avoid any kind of overhead wire. Apart from that, the government had also put a blanket ban. As directed by the Supreme Court, there was a complete ban that was done in order to create any further such equipment. But then something new happened. So then the government of India, in fact, had an objection to this blanket ban. It said that although Precautions are necessary to protect the species, but creating a blanket ban once again will undermine India's efforts to go carbon neutral. And therefore, recently, it was just now in March 21st, 2024, that the Supreme Court modified its earlier verdict. It said that, let us stop the blanket ban, but then 
let's appoint a committee, a committee of scientists who will specifically look into the issue as to what kind of initiatives can be taken and what precautions can be followed while creating solar power equipments. So therefore, the debate is ongoing today. For the environmental enthusiasts, it is not a good sign because, again, it is paradoxical because just about, say, two weeks back, the Supreme Court once again made a milestone verdict when it said that right against climate change or right to protection against climate problems is again a fundamental right. In fact, the Supreme Court said that just like we have Article 14, right to equality, and Article 21, right to life, right against climate change is also absolutely a part of right to life. And why is it a part of right to equality? It is because we all know that it is the vulnerable, the poor segments of population who are more prone to climate change and its problems. And therefore, they also have all equal rights vis-a-vis -vis other segments of population against such climate atrocities. Now, on the one hand, the Supreme Court is committed to making right to a healthy climate akin to a fundamental right. And on the other hand, this recent verdict of removing the blanket ban is leaving so many loopholes in the law. The government is now adhering to the demand the Supreme Court is now adhering to the demand of the government. Here, the government is clearly prioritizing zero carbon emission. But at the same time, what about conserving efforts that have been undertaken so far? So this is the key argument made by the article that this committee, which the Supreme Court has now appointed to look specifically into the issue and then give recommendations to protect the Great Indian Bustard, as well as continue with India's renewable energy program, will submit its report, say, by July 2024, and then the final judgment will come. But what about until then? So many reports which clearly highlight that, yes, there have been deaths of this animal. Why are they being neglected? That's one thing. The second thing that the article talks about is a suggestion for future. The article says that whenever you make a transition, say, from existing sources of energy to new and renewable sources of energy it is never a smooth transition so therefore let's make sure that it is not a very hurried decision let's make sure that in the process of going carbon neutral we are not neglecting the needs of the vulnerable now be it animals or be it even humans for that matter so the article is talking about a framework that is known as a just transition framework when i say just here it means a fair a reasonable transition framework wherein whenever we adopt a new policy, it should make sure that it is inclusive because India has diversities. Now, let's remember that today we have a certain segment of population which, despite the upcoming election, is showing no enthusiasm for it. Why are these voters so unenthusiastic? Because today's Hindu again mentioned how there are certain tribals in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, areas of Rajasthan and Northeast who still are experiencing severe water crisis. They are experiencing poor electricity supply. Now let's remember it is the segment of population that is often the most hurt by climate change. So then, when we talk about a transition, shouldn't we make sure that all these people are a part of it, they are not excluded from it. So, while adopting solar energy, let's make sure it is not just a corporate-dominated domain. In fact, every individual in India, every animal that is critically endangered has a right to be protected under this transition regime to make it more equitable and to make it more exclusive, inclusive and not exclusive. So, therefore, today we have opportunities for creating a very systematic, inclusive climate action. For that matter, when the Supreme Court's expert committee's decision will come, the article is in fact requesting, it is making a demand that whatever decision be taken, let's make sure that things are done in such a way that we do not spoil things in the process of achieving some things that are new. So, whether it be activists, whether it be those people who are creating legitations for a fair action, whether it be scientists, academia. Let's make sure that everybody equally shares the burden of climate change and therefore equally bears the responsibility of climate mitigation. It is not a domain of few. In fact, it is a domain which should be dominated by everyone. So common discourse has to be included. That's what the article talks about. With this, let's quickly proceed with the second article of the day. Now, this is coming from page 10. It is again ecology and it talks about India's heat action plans, heat action plans today 
are in dying need of India because as you all know that southern part of India, particularly the states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, they are already experiencing summer temperatures that used to be unheard of just a few years back. So this year, February started and we already got initiated into the summer season. The temperatures in most of the southern states are already touching 40 degrees. And this is when we are just midway into April. So it is this kind of a drastic heat wave that we are experiencing that has prompted the writers of the article to question how prepared we are to face these heat waves because the way the world is progressing, it is clear that these heat waves are not a one-off. In fact, every year now, from February itself, the government has to be very well prepared to deal with these heat wave challenges because not only do they create a problem of health, not only do they create an imminent health crisis. Now, we already might have heard how as temperatures and rain cycles are drifting, we are hearing of cases of cholera, a lot of communicable, a lot of vector borne diseases that are spreading in southern states apart from that of course there is a talk of the bird flu so whenever we have seen the heat increases too much it also comes with an compromised immunity on the part of individuals once again creating a heavy health infrastructure burden but not only that it is also impacting the lives of many workers at the end of the day it is impacting economic growth it is very very dangerous because it is also impacting our cropping patterns if this is the magnitude of the problem then what is this new heat action plan so the article begins by talking about what is heat wave exactly so as per the india meteorological department's definition the criteria for declaring a heat wave differs from one region to another for example if you talk about a plain area of land a heat wave shall be declared if the maximum temperature reaches 40 degrees celsius or in fact even higher and when you talk about a hilly a mountainous regime a mountainous terrain then if it is 37 degrees celsius or higher then safely we can say that yes it is a heat wave for certain other areas forested hilly it might be anywhere above 30 to 35 degrees as well so there are differences of topography there are differences of elevation there are differences of nearness to see all these determine that what shall be constituted and considered at heat as heat wave in a particular state. Now, severity, how extreme is a heat wave, is typically determined by the variation from current temperature and the normal temperature, the normal average temperature in the past few years. So, a normal heat wave is normally when there is a difference of about 4.5 degrees Celsius between average previous year temperatures and the current temperature but it becomes severe if it actually crosses six degrees celsius mark so that's when we know it is kind of a climate emergency that has clicked in so today as we are witnessing the condition in southern indian states we can say that indeed with the delay of pre-monsoonal showers now you might have read in your ncrt's how in the states of karnataka and certain parts of maharashtra there used to be pre-monsoon showers often known as mango showers because these were the ones who prompted the ripening of mangoes very very famous the local varieties of mangoes here but if you look at 2024 there has been no such shower so not only is it impacting your cropping and horticulture patterns but you see how different it is from the existing temperature norms so in this scenario how are we tackling these heat waves so with severe and frequent heat waves increasing in india now as is the current situation also across the country as per the government's decision the state district and city authorities are now preparing a very detailed systematic plan which looks a little bit like this the illustration that's done here now this is different for every city and sometimes for bigger cities it is different from one area of the city to another area so here the government creates a kind of road map what shall we do in case the heat wave crosses its extreme limit in that case these plans target by creating strategies not only how to mitigate first is to prevent how to prevent such heat waves so the government will have a long-term plan that is about afforestation stopping any kind of cutting of high carbon sequestration rate trees 
Sometimes the government would take actions by creating more green spaces in the city or by creating empty basins for storing water. All these could be preventive in nature. Sometimes the measures are mitigative. For example, the government might create free health camps, you know, where people who are often suffering from heat strokes, particularly children or pregnant women or the elderly, could go and find treatment. They could find some rehydration therapies. Similarly, sometimes the government also then talks about how to recover once the heat wave has already hit a place very, very badly. So the National Disaster Management Authority and the India Meteorological Department together are working to create these plans. So while one is taking care of the environmental aspect, the other is taking care of how to rescue communities in case any climate-oriented disaster take place. Now we know that while coastal areas suffer from annual flooding, even when there's a heat wave, there are severe environmental crisis. For example, very often we experience land cracking. It is happening in many, many states. We also experience acute shortage of drinking water. Now, initially we heard about Simla. Today it is Bengaluru, which is registering a very high crisis when the, of drinking water. And in fact, in these situations, it is also the groundwater whose level gets extremely depleted. So what about water that's needed, not only for consumption, but also for irrigation? So these are certain areas where the National Disaster Management Authority steps in. So this plan is being created for about, say, 23 states who are all developing their action plans, which work in such a manner that, first, they also educate public. They educate public by providing campaigns. Campaigns regarding how to create heat safety nets or heat safety shelters for humans and animal population, cooling centers, clean drinking water that's to be provided free to people across various spots, various areas in the city so that dehydration and associated health disorders can be prevented. Similarly, we are talking about early warning system wherein by seeing the IMD forecast, the governments at various levels will already be aware about the upcoming crisis and they can take up water preservation steps much in advance rather than take them much later. They also, these plans are also providing special prepared work staff in hospitals which will take care of all the necessary equipment and supplies to people who are experiencing problems with regards to heat waves. Heat related illness and emergencies shall be taken care of extra duty. Doctors are being provided at medical camps also. They also talk about long-term measures as we spoke about, such as mitigating the problem of urban heat island. Where most of the times urban cities are now becoming like heat traps. They are becoming heat islands because there is too much heat that's getting, you can say, trapped in these areas. Obviously, there's poor vegetation and on top of it, there's absolutely a lack of water bodies which can absorb the extra heat. There is a lack of rainfall that's taking place because of the early summer that has kicked in. So here, the government is also talking about heat resisting building material for further upcoming construction, proper tree plantation, creating public parks and gardens in order to mitigate the heat island effect as we spoke about. Also, creating roof cooling technologies. Now, when we talk about all these integrated set of technologies, this reminds me of something very interesting. In fact, back in 2021, the Indian government had borrowed a concept from the government of China that was first implemented in Beijing. This was known as the Sponge City Mission, quite important for the UPSC. Talking about the Sponge City Mission, here the idea was to create a city or create various cities in India that act like sponge. A sponge or a sponge is a material which absorbs extra water. So here, you create rooftops which are green, rooftop gardens. You create empty basins to encourage rainwater harvesting. In fact, the roads are also claimed to be made up of such a porous material which can expand a little bit to absorb the extra water so that there is no wastage and runoff of extra monsoonal water. Plus, creating gardens and places in the city which can act like carbon sequestration tanks. So all these in the light of Spawn City Mission today in India are being implemented through the heat wave mitigation plans or the HAPs that we are talking about. 
However, the article says there are certain challenges associated with these plans. The first thing is that most of the times these plans have a poor understanding of the local problems of local communities. For example, if you're making a plan for a city, we are often neglecting the suburban area, the problem of the villagers and the tribal populations that are existing in the periphery of the cities. That's a problem. Another issue is that we lack proper consistent methodology because today, although we can take rescue action, but we aren't really ready to take any preventive action. We always realize once the problem has begun, not before. So this is something that we need to be more robust about. For example, hotspot mapping. Where do we foresee the problem being worse? Or for example, climate risk assessment, assessment so that in advance we can adopt a methodology to prevent any casualty or any kind of extreme crisis in case there is a delayed rainfall or too high temperature. Similarly, we are not taking care of the vulnerable population. Now, in every city, when you talk about the slum dwelling population, when you talk about the homeless population or when you talk about people who are living in kacha houses or people who are living in the low income houses. Now, again, these have nothing to do with any kind of initiative that's being mentioned here. So we are not talking about any specific plan to create better construction for these areas. The most of these housings are very congested. There is a poor adequate water supply, poor sanitation, which further becomes a breeding grounds of diseases. So that is something that we need to specifically focus upon, especially the informal workers who are also often into blue collar work and therefore they are exposing themselves to outdoor work in such high temperature situation then we need to talk about better resource allocation not only for the from the government but also we need to encourage the concept of voluntary contribution by the people NGOs could also be roped in self-help groups could be created around this concept for better implementation and at the same time rather than focusing only upon AI generated solutions or rather than only talk about say infrastructural solutions we can talk about natural solutions also for example a simple thing like creating green and blue spaces creating forested and water spaces at a greater number could be an ex extremely effective solution which will save us the money to actually invest in you know uh, any kind of very expensive heat resistant building material so before we invest into that Let's just go the nature way first. So the approach has to be a little more organic. That's what the article says. And on that light, let's have a look at the third article. That's page 11 coming to you from GS3. That's science. The article says, what is agroforestry? What wonders can agroforestry do? To highlight the benefits of agroforestry, the article has taken up a case study from Tamil Nadu, where in 2018, a very severe cyclone had hit and then after suffering from the aftermath of that cyclone, the local people adapted to climate forest, to agroforestry. And today they are thanking themselves because not only are they earning better profits, but the soil is producing much better results. So what is agroforestry then? So talking about agroforestry, as the name suggests, now it is not a concept that is new in India. In India, from the very beginning, farmers would in fact practice agroforestry. Farmers would take up polycropping. Farmers would take up mixed farming. All these were predominant in India before the Green Revolution. Even the article here highlights that it was only after the 1960s Green Revolution that farmers in India got prompted towards monocropping. Under monocropping, large areas of land or available areas of fertile land were sown with a single crop, a single seed a single plant in order to improve its productivity so that the farmers can earn better income and specifically these crops were chosen on the basis of MSP so the government was giving a higher minimum support price on a certain crop the farmers would choose to grow that crop now this had certain economic benefits of course it added to food security in India but it had major problems also. Now one of the biggest problems was that due to monocropping, after a certain period of time the soil lost its fertility. The soil which now was used to using too much pesticide, fertilizer and chemical manure or too much irrigation now became so saline that the soil's natural fertility went for a toss. There was nothing that could restore that. It became a vicious cycle of 
constantly adding poisonous fertilizers and pesticides and constant dropping of land fertility. That's one problem. Another problem is that since we started monocropping, in case there was a damage to that single crop that the farmers were growing now, the farmers had no alternative to depend upon. So these are certain problems which began after Green Revolution. No wonder. In the process of getting food security, in the process of solving hunger, we have endangered not only biodiversity but also we have endangered something more fundamental and that is health itself, the health of people itself. So in this regard, the article says agroforestry could be a very good solution, a multi-dimensional solution. On the one hand, it enables you to restore the fertility of soil. On the second hand, it gives you more variety in the same land with a marginal piece of land. Also, a farmer today can not only grow major crops, but also go for horticulture, go for animal husbandry. It's an all-in-one solution to promote farmer income and biodiversity at the same time. So what is agroforestry then? So agroforestry is that mechanism of farming where you are growing trees and shrubs alongside your crops. Sometimes you also involve animal husbandry into it. It is kind of an all-encompassing, a much wider perspective of farming and therefore it creates not only environmental sustainability but also it is creating better economic and social benefits for the farmers and for the community at large. The article therefore talks about the benefits of agroforestry. It also says what are certain problems in adopting agroforestry in India today. Now, let's talk about a little historical context. Now, as we know in India, it is a tradition it's a part of our cultivating tradition that we have been doing, we had been doing agroforestry. As I said, it was until the monocropping obsession of Green Revolution. Now, we cannot blame the farmers either. If the government was giving minimum support price on, say, sugarcane, say, oil, say, wheat, say, rice, the people, the farmers would grow that. The sad part was that not only did we stop growing our local varieties, a very good example here could be vegetables and millets, which today we are realizing as we are going back to organic and healthy, native eating, today we realize that. Another fallout was the health problem that was coming with a huge dependence on rich carbohydrate diet, rice, wheat, sugar cane. The third fallout was that the benefit of this green revolution only went to farmers who were already very rich. And they only went to specific states like Punjab, UP and Tamil Nadu. It did not go to any other state as much. So therefore, there was only a regional benefit that we got. Plus, the rich farmers got richer. What about the farmers who had smaller land holdings? They couldn't benefit much because of the monocropping. And therefore, Green Revolution, on a very, very social, cultural, environmental aspect, could not do us as well as we thought it would. So today, when we go back to agroforestry, we are talking about the case study of Tamil Nadu, where, as I said, in 2018, the Gaja cyclone had hit very, very badly. Now, this Gaja cyclone had devastated all the coconut trees, all the plantations of coconut in the fields of local farmers. So here we are talking about a farmer whom we are studying from a place, a small village in Tamil Nadu, the farmer named Chitra. Now, this person says that after the cyclone, all his coconut farms got devastated. Not only that, the soil became completely infertile because it was very salty and saline now because of the invasion of sea water. So what did he do? So therefore, he and many other farmers like him, they pooled their money in a very, very self-help group-like structure, in a very cooperative farming-like structure. They all pooled their resources and then they started growing mango trees and jackfruit trees in huge number. What was the result? Just few years down the lane, less than four, five years. Today, these farmers are registering very good profits. The soil is back healthy, fertile once again. It is not only promoting coconut production, but many other varieties of soil, including millets, and therefore they have enough to feed themselves, they have enough that they can sell in the market. So you see the wonders of agroforestry here. So now this case study, therefore, the article says, points out to the larger need of adopting agroforestry across India. Today, the biggest problem is that even after national agroforestry policy in 2014, where the government was creating awareness among farmers to promote and adopt agroforestry on a large scale, the problem is that the benefit was very, very segmental. Only the farmers who were well-off, who had 
noticeably larger pieces of land were ready to adopt agroforestry who had lands anywhere between medium to large scale land holdings but what about the ones who were small scale land holders what about those those small farmers were facing a problem because of many many reasons many many causes one fundamental problem was the land they have is too small if it's too small they cannot promote too many kind of crops and too many plants too many trees on their small area of land second thing is the problem with input availability since they cannot afford enough seeds at least good quality seeds and they cannot afford good quality manure and herbicides they therefore cannot grow many kind of plants another problem is they have a less capacity to deal with climate challenges they also have poor machinery and hence what happens they are not producing enough their land automatically after a certain time becomes fallow it becomes infertile and then they have to depend on non agriculture labor and typically that is the migration construction labor that's one thing that the article says another problem is that since these people who are the small farmers are not into agroforestry they are not able to restore the fertility of their land if they will not grow enough obviously they cannot do it on a commercial scale and therefore they also have a very poor market linkage now since they even are people who do not have a very higher level of literacy and awareness they do not have access to government programs welfare schemes ngos and self help groups who can enable them such access to inputs and machinery or funding at least so therefore the article also discusses the trees outside of forest the tofi initiative of india which is a joint initiative taken by the indian ministry of environment forest and climate change along with us agency for international development together it tries to create better more and more more aggressive tree cover in seven selected states of india and particularly they want to inculcate expansion of tree cover in the lands of poor farmer by telling them to go for cooperative farming so that they can join the lands together they can pool in resources and hence go for agroforestry now as we say agroforestry is a very multi dimensional concept so therefore there are certain challenges for example if a farmer wants to grow many different kinds of crops and trees he wants to do cropping horticulture animal husbandry now this is a water incentive thing you need a lot of water for animal husbandry or for that matter even for growing your crops and growing more trees now definitely certain crops like paddy say for example or cotton they could be water intensive crops also so in that case what happens the repeated concern of small farmer is lack of access to irrigation facilities recently we spoke about the pm kusum scheme that is also being implemented in pilot mode where farmers are now being given funds to create solar plants you know these solar irrigation pumps will now give them the additional water supply plus the extra water can also be channelized into market giving extra income to the farmers even the government will purchase somewhat from the farmer so for the farmer it is a win win situation but once again it has not reached most of the small farmers today as we talk about in majority of for example peninsular indian states the article therefore also says why can't the government encourage these farmers to grow trees which are less water demanding so trees which have a high carbon sequestration rate which have a high a uh, sort of instance of providing soil fertility and a greater produce but at the same time they do not depend on too much water now here a critical a very good example could be millets for example millets are environmentally friendly millets are not water intensive and yet they can yield sustainability to a farmer with very less inputs and with very less care millets could also promote farmers commercial a uh, sort of access to the market so they can earn better through the growing growth of millet similarly selecting such native species which not only demand less water but also enhance soil fertility and therefore they will also promote biodiversity because once you are growing native species and by the way native species grow very fast because they are endemic to a particular area and hence with lesser inputs the farmer can have better results so all these should be ideas spread by the government and by ngos into the community of small scale farmers apart from that as a part of this initiative that we just spoke about the government is also today planning to provide tools to the farmer which is known as the toolkit now under this toolkit the government will provide various 
jal tool for example jal tool so these will be things which will make sure that the farmers have better access to mechanized or cost effective cropping also decision tools like diversity for restoration these could be certain intelligence in some disseminating strategies wherein the farmers will come to know which plant to grow at what time of the year what is the demand for water for a particular plant what will be the resultant produce and how can the farmer then reach out to the market for better income so these could be certain other things that the government could provide alongside agroforestry so the article overall makes a very strong claim for agroforestry the article also says that we need better financing mechanisms for example ecosystem credit or paying for ecosystem service this could also be a wonderful system to incentivize to encourage agroforestry adoption by the small farmers similarly we need to also talk about making sure that the land reform stage 2 in india for example we often say that the second major the first major land reforms in fact that were taken back in 1950s itself in that in 1960s if you remember there was a very popular in ongoing theme which spoke about land consolidation the whole idea was to consolidate small small fragmented pieces of land at one place so that farmers could now take up large scale farming for profit this is something again which the article is trying to hint at in fact that we could also encourage land consolidation in case farmers or families farming families are holding fragmented areas of land because the more consolidated the land holding the better agroforestry possibilities arise also the government must make sure through its uh, in in with the spirit of say redistributive justice in the line of its socialistic responsibility that probably small scale land holdings could be enhanced a little bit by government giving certain lands to poor farmers so that they could easily take up cooperative farming so in conclusion we can say that among other policies a healthy ecosystem and a healthy livelihood could be greatly fostered if we adopt agroforestry but on a very very systematic ongoing basis and on that note we can now come to page number 1 this is an article for the prelims and it talks about economy it says the center is now making a bid towards green credit program and it says that in the long run it will enable better robust ecosystem once again in the light of ongoing climate crisis and a complete reversal of seasonal cycle the extreme high heat waves that we are experiencing today the government feels that individuals and companies can now come and take up this responsibility by carrying out afforestation which means they can grow more plant and trees and to do that the government will encourage them by providing green credit points so what is green credit so a green credit is like a voluntary system where people are encouraged to grow more trees and plants in return they can earn some credit points in the long run the government wants that a trading platform shall be created on a domestic market level so that you can in cash you can get finances financial access for all the green credit points that you have accumulated now this can be done by an individual or by a company in the light of their corporate social corporate ecological responsibility say for example they take up cultivation of a farm and then they can register how many acres of land have they covered by afforestation what initiative have they taken they can register this on a government website the dedicated portal that the government will be providing and hence they will be allotted certain points for that in the long run it can work like a full blown trading platform on a domestic scale so this would encourage people more more and more aggressively to grow plants this is the brief outline of the scheme so it ultimately encourages people to grow crops and plants in areas that are degraded and fallow which are lying as wasteland they are not under the cultivated area not under the net zone area not under the forested area these are the completely wasted lands so the overview of the program is that the forest department of 13 states has offered they have been offering 387 land parcels of completely fallow degraded land which is totaling about more than 10000 hectares now this needs to be restored so a better solution could be let individuals and corporate houses come forward to ensure and take in their own hands the responsibility of a foresting or growing 
vegetation in these areas. But what will motivate them to do that? Probably not just the notion of responsibility, but definitely a better encouragement comes when you provide them some kind of financial promise in return. To corporates, the government can do much more. For example, upon getting a certain degree of credit, green credit points, the government could possibly tomorrow provide these companies a tax holiday or a free electricity supply for a certain period of time. Or the government could provide them better lands for creating further corporate expansion. Many other kind of SOPs and tax-free incentives in order to come and restore degraded land. On an individual level, indeed, the prospect of having a trading platform by earning green credit points could be a wonderful prospect that could encourage people to take this initiative up. So therefore, green credits are such that after two years of planting, each tree that has been planted will be worth earning one green credit. This shall be evaluated by the Indian Council of Forestry Research and Education, which is abbreviated as ICFRE. Now, the green credits as of now are not tradable. You cannot trade them in any platform. But tomorrow, as I said, the government is making sure that we shall create a domestic market platform which will earn people money for what? For becoming ecologically conscious. So it's like a win-win situation completely. And the green credits tomorrow could also be used to obtain carbon credits, you know. And they could be measured just vis-a-vis -vis or in terms of reduction of carbon emissions. So on the one hand, you are reducing your carbon footprint. That will also be rated. And on the other hand, the more plants and the trees you grow, the more vegetation you are doing, the more green credit you can earn. There are certain challenges, however. The article highlights that sometimes it is kind of very, uh, you can say, fake. It looks very, very superficial that people are getting encouraged to grow trees by promising them some credit in return. So probably people will just do it for money or for some kind of vested benefit. But definitely they will not do it because they are becoming ecologically conscious. So only growing trees is not enough. There are many other things we can do if we are environmentally conscious. For example, water conservation or installing a solar rooftop panel if it's coming at an affordable rate. What we could also do is to simplify lifestyle by saying say no to single-use plastics or for that matter Reuse, reusing, recycling organic waste. So these are all the things that are together done to reduce carbon footprint. Merely or only encouraging people to grow trees instead of money will probably not solve the purpose. That's what the article also is saying. So therefore, the government has responded by saying that there is one more clause in the program that the program of green credit scheme will give more importance to in indigenous or local species, not generally to the hybrid variety or not generally to the imported varieties of plants and seeds, but to the local variety so that we can also preserve biodiversity and local flora. That's very, very important. Several public sector companies have already registered to invest in the program. For example, the Indian Oil Corporation or for that matter, the Power Grid Corp and the Coal India. The program is as of now running in a very, very minimal pilot project. But future, the government sees a major prospect here as many more private sector companies will come roping inside. So as of now, the debate is that whether it is logical, whether it is moralistically logical to actually encourage people by incentivizing them monetarily to grow plants or will this be a very superficial scheme? What we actually need is a broader awareness of becoming environmentally conscious. So that is something that's under the scanner right now. And this is the kind of debate or you can say the dilemma that the article overall points at. The next article here is page 16 and it talks about how Israel is persistent. And Netanyahu from Israel, Israel's head of the state has clearly said that we shall do whatever it takes to safeguard our national security and we know that it is not a new piece of news it is an ongoing uh, saga of developments wherein much earlier israel had attacked the iranian consulate in syria because israel was targeting all the hamas outfit locations all the extremist locations that were anti-israel in that process iran had vowed to revenge which it eventually did by targeting about 300 drones and missiles at Israel. Now Israel said that out of these 300 we have already 
intercepted most of them. So not much damage was done, although there were certain military bases that were hit. Now, as a result, the world is now keenly observing the response of Israel, wherein Iran says that we were just taking a revenge which happened because our consulate was attacked, our people were killed in the process and therefore we had to do this. But we do not expect Israel to react any further because any further reaction from Israel once again will be an invitation to a full-blown war. Now this full-blown invitation at a time when already West Asian crisis is brewing so strong, there is no end to the war. Now the ongoing negotiations also are seeming to be stalling because there is no way that the Israel-Palestine conflict is dying down. No, in fact, it is ongoing. And hence, the world is now cajoling, it is requesting. For example, the UK, the US authorities have been negotiating with the Israeli government that any kind of retaliation right now will not be a good decision because already the situation is very tense and it could only escalate the crisis further. But Israeli head of the state has clearly said that the attack that we experienced was unprecedented. Not only the attack that we had last year when we were attacked by the Hamas militants, but even now, the way Iran has attacked Israel, it is one of its own kind of provocation. So today Israel is saying that we will retaliate when the right time comes. Now, what, what is this right time and exactly which time frame are we talking about is something that the world is keenly looking at, in fact, dreading to look at. So. This is something that the article is trying to highlight. Now, while visiting Israel, the British Foreign Secretary David Cameron and German Foreign Minister, they emphasized the importance of avoiding any further urgency in the war, given the already difficult situation. Now, let's remember that the war that's ongoing has had a lot of ramification for other economies as well, from cutting down supply chains to the constant Houthi attacks on US, UK, ships, vessels in the Red Sea area had created blockages of supply chain. It had created terrorist attacks and the fear of further war mongering in the region. Now, in that light, any further retaliation by Israel could again fuel a war that the world is not prepared for right now. So, therefore, the efforts are underway by most of the countries, including the EU, that sanctions against Iran are also taken in the toughest possible manner because just as we are experiencing the tension, Iran has recently also tested another arsenal, another missile and Iran is a full-blown nuke power now, something that the Western governments have not liked and they have constantly been criticizing. Iran's constantly ambitious missiles and drone programs are something that the United States has been cautioning against, but at the same time, they are going on, going unabated. So therefore, the conflict between Israel and Hamas is continuing. The peace talks are not making headway. And now the response is coming from the Prime Minister of Israel that all the claims that Israel has created a famine, a food shortage, a humanitarian crisis, a genocide in Palestine is fake. Israeli Prime Minister said that we are monitoring humanitarian aid and efforts too. So both sides have their own narrative to create. But in the same situation, the UN has also prepared about $2.8 billion assistance for those who are stranded in Palestine and in the occupied West Bank region. So in this light, the next move of Israel is something that everybody is observing because now that will make the final conclusion of the ongoing tension that is brimming in the region. With that note, the last article for the day is Economy that's coming to you from page 15. It talks about how the Indian economy is projected to grow at the rate of 6.5% in the financial year 2024. And this has come from the report of UN Trade and Development, that is UNCDAD. Now, therefore, this article says that economic growth in India, which already has been on the higher side, although it dipped to a certain extent in January, because of the low capex expenditure is once again projected to rise to a mark of about 6.5%. And this is an estimate that is made not only by the UN CTAD, but also by the International Monetary Fund. They say that Indian economy will actually reach the growth rate of 6.7%, nearly, which, will, which it also had touched upon during 2023. And it says that in back in 2023, the last financial year, it was the huge public investment 
and the services sector growth that had resulted in such a high economic growth. It says that even today, Indian economy will continue to hold its spot as the third or the fourth largest economy in the world with a very, very high GDP growth rate. The major reason behind this growth as per article as it is an increase in multinational manufacturing expenditure and a lot of manufacturing process that is coming to India from China. Now remember earlier China was the hub of all the manufacturing. So therefore all the MNC offshoring when it came to manufacturing and assembly was going to China. But today it is India and Vietnam that are actually attracting most of this manufacturing process and China in fact is not but India and Vietnam are the new leaders here. So India being a large economy and with a young skilled manpower is already to overtake China when it comes to a huge potential supply chain and manufacturing. So therefore this shift will have a very positive impact also on Indian exports and also this is a situation where Chinese economy in fact is registering a lower growth. It's just 4.9% in 2024. With this the report also highlights that India and China despite having faced a lot of financial troubles in the post-pandemic regions, plus the climate change issues, underinvestment inequalities, will, despite that, will outdo the performance of most Western economies. And IMF has also projected that Indian economic growth could also go beyond 6.8% driven by domestic demand also because we know that we have a huge working age population. We can talk about demographic dividend here. So that translates not only into a better consumption but also into better production and manufacturing. Now on that note, let's quickly have a look at two important questions for the day. The first question talks about discuss the importance or significance of agroforestry. You need to define agroforestry and then talk about its benefits in the light of all the problems that we had due to the monocrop of green revolution in India. How is agroforestry a sustainable land use practice in India? Evaluate the effectiveness of national agroforestry policy of 2024 and please examine the challenges faced by small farmers or poor farmers in adopting agroforestry practices, something typically that we discussed in the article here, say about in 250 words for 20 marks. The second question here is coming from environmental change. We are talking about the heat wave mitigation programs. So evaluate the components of heat action plans or heat wave action plan. We just spoke about them. You need to define them, including short term and long term measures. We did speak about both and do analyze the challenges faced in their implementation, something directly taken from the discussion. Again, 250 words. And now on this note, I take your leave for today's session. I hope you enjoyed and you were benefited by it. See you very soon in future with many such exciting sessions. In the meantime, thank you so much to all of you.